All right, let's move on to um, the second of our studies we want to focus on. Tony, I'm going to pick on you to lead this discussion. It's known as the PRIME trial, full FOX plus minus panitumumab. Um, tell us a little bit about the study and the impact of this result and recently published in the New England Journal. So that's a, that's a very interesting uh, study, at least analysis. As you know, the PRIME trial uh, was already, uh, in its original form, was already published and is on the NCN guidelines to lead us to use full FOX4 plus penetumumab as an option uh, in treating patients with metastatic colorectal cancer first line. Uh, the initial design was to select for KRAS eggs on two uh, wild type patients and uh, the primary endpoint was progression free survival was, which was reached. Uh, so it was a positive study but survival was numerically improved then uh, but not better. Now, in the analysis that now is published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and has also been presented at ASCO, uh, they actually expanded the RAS mutational analysis. So to include uh, exon 2, 3, and 4 for KRAS and RAS. Uh, and they also did an analysis on BRAF. That's a little separate discussion. Uh, and the ascertainment rate was still pretty high, a little bit above 90%, so a good ascertainment rate. And after they've done this analysis, all the numbers looked better, and now the survival uh, has uh, gone uh, to about six additional months with the addition of uh, penitumumab, uh, which ends up being statistically significant. So now the study, when you select for more RAS mutations, ends up uh, being uh, positive on every efficacy uh, uh, point, which means response rate, progression-free survival, and for the first time, overall survival. What, what's interesting, and that again confirms uh, other studies, is that BRAF mutation did not have a predictive value for the use, utilization of EGFR, meaning that a BRAF mutation should not exclude you from receiving the EGFR inhibitor, in this uh, case, penitumumab. Uh, and so it had a prognostic uh, significance, but not a predictive significance. So I think overall, uh, the gist of the study is that uh, uh, an all-across RAS mutational analysis improved even further, improves even further, and that's an additional 10% additional of, of patients, which you add to the RAS mutation pool, uh, the selective power uh, of that mutational analysis and improves even further the selection of patients who would benefit from uh, penitumumab. So this study, kind of going a little out of order for us, really brings forward that we need to understand better what mutations we need to be measuring and how deeply we need to dive. I remember back not a year or two ago, we were all debating the 13D mutation. And is that really, you know, oh no, they're in, they can get the drug versus not. And what you're telling me is that in fact, we're finding more and more refinement to narrow the patient population. And once we do that, we get better uh, targeting, better outcomes. Axel, we sort of come back to you on what should we be measuring today in patients uh, with metastatic colorectal cancer? I mean, to kind of uh, continue what, about what Tony said, you know, what I find most intriguing and kind of mandating our new approach toward molecular detection and molecular characterization is that those patients who had, who had the RAS mutations and actually were treated with um, penetumab in the context of Forfax actually had a detrimental effect. Now, you know, we don't only want to kind of improve outcomes, you also clearly don't want to harm patients. So if we don't select those patients out, which were about 17% of patients, which we do not detect right now with our conventional KRAS tests that you and I all send out to our labs, if we, at least in the context of oxaplatin-based therapy and validate for penetumab, we might be harming patients. So I can easily see that there is a great need to be more sophisticated in our detection. We clearly need KRAS, exon 2, 3, 4, NRAS, so the lower frequency mutations. We can eliminate about almost 60% of patients from treatment with EGF receptor antibodies right up front. And then we've just opened the door toward other parameters. I mean, pic 3 ca mutation, all along the lines of the EGF receptor signaling pathway. Um, what about P10 expression levels, EGF receptor ligand expression levels? All these things will eventually allow us, uh, hopefully very soon, to have a panel that will refine the patient population that should not, or actually should, eventually should be treated with EGF receptor antibodies. And then beyond that, you know, the next generation of, let's say, hopefully new agents 
um, MET inhibitors, for instance, is still this discussion, how do you identify the MET overexpressors? Is it a, a kind of protein-based assay? Is it a, 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 a genetic-based assay, kind of a DNA assay, RNA assay? Um, there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's for the first time actually in colorectal cancer, I believe that we are appreciating the power and the need for molecular characterization. Yeah. Fadi, tell us what the current thinking is. You're sort of representing uh, both U.S. oncology and the clinical research efforts out there. Uh, day to day, what would you say to a guy out there practicing uh, in terms of testing around EGFR? What do you say standard today? In the community uh, settings, you know, physicians always are afraid or concerned about payers mm -hmm. who's going to pay for it and the time because everybody is under the pressure of treating ASAP. Although, for example, molecular testing is not, in many institutions, is not reflex testing. And for example, you know, if we go to the NCCN guidelines, you know, it's of course mandate the KRAS mutation analysis, but does not mandate the BRAF mutation, although supports it. And I believe that list is gonna keep growing over the coming few years. The two challenges are the following. I think all of us physicians should pay attention to the nomenclature. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying KRAS positive and negative, what it is, it is mutation versus wild trap. The same thing with BRAF, V600E mutation versus the other mutation. And the second thing that we really need the guidelines to tell us more about what technique, what technology, is it the PCR, which gonna pick up some of the a mutation we're looking for versus the next gene sequencing, which is going to provide a more comprehensive mutation analysis and pick up these outliers, which are rarest. As of today, KRAS mutation is the requested. BRAF gives us a prognostic factor, although would not mandate against treatment with EGFR inhibitor, and the list to grow. Again, payers, we are afraid that payers may not pay for it, and of course, communicating with the pathologist in the community. Yeah, always crazy. So payers are willing to not, they're not going to pay for the gene test, but they'll pay for the drug. That is backwards. Okay. Alan, let me pick on you. Being around long enough, I've watched us do the 13D dance and all of this. What's enough data? for us to say that this is harmful. I mean, I've seen those curves too, where you've got you know, a small subset of patients and harm was given uh, in that patient base. Is that enough? Do we need to do confirmatory studies in this patient population? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, much of what we do uh, would be easier if it was black and white. And because it's shades of gray, I think the decision is always between you and your patient. I think in the absence of absolutism, you, you will always err on towards giving your patient the benefit of the doubt, and, and so it's very hard to avoid not doing some treatments, even though the data may suggest they're deleterious. I mean, we do have a few examples where I think we'd all agree the data is compelling, such as combination chemotherapy with double biologics with the EGFR and VEGF inhibitors. The data is pretty compelling that that's not a good combination. Uh, and yet, we st some of us wonder if we were to enrich for the right population, we might see benefit. So, so I think the truth is we can talk in the abstract about what, to do, what is bad and what we shouldn't do, but when the patient's in front of you, uh, you, you may do most anything, uh, depending on the nature of their disease and how, how the biology is playing out. 